Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. I still remember the day I sent in my DNA test to one of those websites. I wondered if I'd find relatives. What I didn't know was I'd discover I had been adopted. How I came to be adopted is an odd story and for another day, as what I want to detail is an encounter with something that has also changed my life immensely. When I got an email from a man who claimed to be my half-brother, I didn't know what to believe. We exchanged emails for a few weeks, then a few calls, and before I knew it, I was on a plane to go visit him and finally get to meet my biological father. They lived in rural Arkansas, just southeast of Little Rock. I don't want to name the town out of concern. I don't want people swarming it looking for Bigfoot. When we first met, I couldn't help but see the resemblance. It was odd meeting someone I could call my biological brother, as my adoptive parents, whom I love immensely, hadn't had other children. The drive from the airport south was interesting. One thing that struck me was how green Arkansas was. Never having spent much time outside of my home state of Nevada, I was so used to seeing desert, though the endless trees and vibrant green colors seemed more dramatic to the eyes than they probably were. After about two hours on the road, we made a left turn into a long gravel drive and started to head east. A thick grove of tall, skinny pine trees lined the road. Then it opened up to a large open space, and smack dab in the center were a couple of trailers. Yup, my Arkansas relatives literally were cliché Southerners who lived in double wide. I hadn't had a chance to exit the car before I saw the front door of one of the trailers fling open and out stepped a tall, skinny man. He was adorned in what I would jokingly call the country boy uniform, consisting of a t-shirt, typically a black rifle coffee or grunt-style logo, jeans, boots, and a trucker-style ball cap. My dad threw his arms up in the air and howled out, He's here! His siren call was heard far and wide, because no sooner had I gotten my feet on the ground than I was surrounded by about a dozen people, all some sort of relative. People were laughing, a few crying, and all were happy to see me. I'll admit now, I've never had such a heartwarming homecoming, and that's exactly what it was, a homecoming in my life. After all the greetings and introductions, we all met in the backyard of one of the trailers, which had been adorned with balloons and a welcome home banner, stretching between two old rusty pipes. The beer and barbecue flowed, and I'll say now, it was amazing. I had the best time of my life. The afternoon turned to evening, but my indoctrination into Southern culture wasn't complete unless I went riding around in a four-wheeler, drinking. My brother pulled up behind the wheel, handed me a fresh cold beer from the cooler, strapped the back, and told me to hop on. Not one to argue with a good time. I popped the can and off we went. We raced down the trail and swerved around big thick old hardwoods until we came to a massive clearing near a power line easement. He pulled the four-wheeler over, turned off the lights, and said, now this is living. I stepped out and looked up to a magnificent sky filled with stars with the Milky Way cutting its way across the center. My ears were entertained with the song of frogs and crickets and fireflies lit the space and trees in the distance like twinkling lights on a Christmas tree. 
I told my brother how amazing it was and how special I felt. Do you believe in Bigfoot? He asked me. I chuckled, thinking he was joking. I'm serious. Of course not. It's a made-up thing, much like UFOs and the Loch Ness Monster. Well, I don't know much about that, but Bigfoot is real, and I've seen them all around these parts. In fact, they use this easement to come and go. I again chuckled and began to wonder if all my family believed in nonsense. You don't believe me, do you? Um, no. Watch this, my brother said and pulled out his phone. He clicked through until he came to the file he was looking for. The sound of a baby crying shot out of his phone. I raised my eyebrows, confused by what he was doing. Baby cries? Just watch, he said with confidence. He turned up the volume on his phone. We just sat there for what seemed like forever. We were out of beer, and I was growing tired. I asked if we could head back, but just as he was about to answer, I heard this thumping sound coming from the right. The sound was off in the distance, maybe a mile or less. I turned to him and asked, is that it? He simply replied, yup. The thumping sound soon turned to crashing, like trees and branches were being destroyed. I recoiled for a bit and my stomach tightened. Sounds like it's heading toward us, I told him. Yup. You seem so calm, I said. I was getting a bit freaked out, while at the same time I wondered if I was being played. Are you messing with me? Nope. The chasing grew louder and louder. In my right ear, the crashing was reverberating, while in my left, I could hear the baby's cries coming from his phone. You need to tell me what's going on. It's Bigfoot, bro. No, it's not. Yes, it is. As the seconds ticked by, the crashing grew louder, and I became more nervous. I turned and asked how long we'd stay. Soon, I was ready to go now. I finally relented and asked to leave. No, was his reply. The crashing grew closer and closer and louder and louder. When it was a hundred yards or further away, he turned off the recording. Just as it went off, the crashing stopped. I didn't hear anything except for my heart thumping hard in my chest. Then I heard what sounded like heavy breathing in the woods to my right. Imagine a bull or other large beast after it had raced hard. Its breath would be labored. That was what I heard. I was terrified. My brother fired up the four-wheeler and sped off. He howled with joy as he raced back toward the house. I'll admit it now, I was happy. Heck, I was thrilled to be out of there. I never saw anything, but something was out there. I guess it could have been his friends playing a prank, but the sounds of the crashing and thrashing, I'm not so sure. Something large and big seemed to be out there and attracted to the sounds of a crying baby. If it was Bigfoot, I don't understand why that would lure him or her in, but it did. To this day, I'm glad I didn't see anything. If I had, I'm not sure I'd be able to sleep that night. The rest of my trip with the family was amazing, and I never let my brother take me out again. On to the next one. My name is Max, and I went through a terrifying experience. It changed my life. I attended college at San Diego State University, and one of my close friends was a guy by the name of Elias. Elias was a foreign exchange student from Munich, Germany, and he was extremely passionate about outdoor things like camping, hiking, cliff jumping. For his birthday, he requested that a couple of his other friends and I accompany him on a camping trip in a place that was probably about an hour inland from San Diego. Honestly, I can't remember the name of the location. All I do remember about it is that we parked at some random spot along the side of a winding road, 
and headed up a steep incline just beyond where we parked our vehicle. I remember there were pine needles nearly everywhere along the steep path, which made it difficult for our boots to gain any traction along the walk. The place wasn't a designated campground, but rather a random wooded mountainous terrain that caught Elias's eyes while he once drove through the area. I thought it was a bit of a sketchy location when we first arrived, but we all went along with it because we all wanted our friend to enjoy his birthday. He just really seemed to like how there was a good chance that nobody else had ever camped there before. Luckily, it didn't take us very long to reach flat ground, and the place provided a beautiful but haunting view of many charred tree trunks. A few hundred yards behind those tree trunks was another incline that appeared to lead to the tip of the mountain peak. It was February, so I remember it started to get extremely cold and windy once the sun began to set. We had been so focused on drinking our beers that we hadn't even thought to start setting up the tent. We had no choice but to use all four sets of hands to get the things staked into the ground before they blew away. I believe we had nearly finished setting up the last of the tent when something screamed at us from above. My initial reaction was that some large bird was acting territorial because its nest was just above our tent. But it was as soon as the four of us looked up that we noticed a pair of eyes that appeared to reflect the moonlight. Instantly, I could tell that this was no bird. Actually, I thought it was some strange person who had climbed up there unnoticed. It was very odd, and it gave me such a weird feeling in the pit of my stomach. It was a sensation that I found very hard to describe. All I can say is that I knew something wasn't right. Something was very, very wrong, and I somehow knew that we shouldn't be anywhere near there. Who is that? One of my friends said while looking up at the barely visible face confirming that I wasn't the only one who thought it was nothing more than a crazy person. I think it pissed the animal off that we continued to stand there because it soon shrieked so loudly that it seemed it could damage my eardrum. But let me be clear that this shriek was beyond the capabilities of any human. It was so powerful that it had to have projected across several miles. If anyone happened to be driving by where we were parked, there was just no way they wouldn't have heard it. We all backed away once we watched the animal climb down the tree face first. It was so limber, much like a cat. Once it arrived on the ground, it shrieked once more while staring at us, and then it was off. On two legs, it ran in the direction opposite our campsite. Of course, Elias felt the need to go after it to get a better look. Come on, Elias said. I want to find out what that thing is. What? I said dumbfounded by his bravery. Our other friends also hesitated, but we ultimately silently agreed that it was best to stay together. If I hadn't been with three other guys, I don't think there is any chance I would have gone after the strange animal. A couple of minutes went by, where we could hear nothing more than our heavy breathing and footsteps. I think we were all trying to remain silent to get a better idea of whether the animal was on the ground or if it had reclimbed the trees. I have to admit, I was very intimidated by the idea of it dropping down onto one of us. Because why wouldn't an agile predator use tactics like that to capture prey? Eventually, we made it to a ridge and soon heard the sound of medium-sized rocks sliding down the mountainside. Then I noticed a tall silhouette about 30 yards ahead of where we were all standing. One of our friends also noticed it because he had shined a small flashlight in the exact location that I saw movement. At first, it looked like there was nothing there other than the tumbling stone, but 
It was as soon as he redirected the light away from the location that I saw the silhouette rise. Shine it over there again, I commanded of our friend, pointing to the same position on the rocky slope. Hunched over, it moved up the steep incline while occasionally screaming at the four of us. For whatever reason, its eyes no longer appeared to be glowing. It screeched several times while moving up the ridge. The efficiency at which this animal traveled along such a treacherous terrain is still tough to comprehend. It didn't seem like it should be possible. I don't think we would have stuck around to observe any of that if it hadn't been clear that the animal was moving away from us. When it made it onto a ridge, it stood up for a moment and gazed at us before unleashing yet another terrifying scream. I guess it didn't like how we continued to stare at it. And it dropped back onto all fours and lunged headfirst down the slope just below where it was standing. Luckily for us, it seemed to be nothing more than a bluff charge because the animal held its position just below the cliff. It seemed to hang there with such little effort while it stared at us, waiting to see whether we would attempt to come any closer. By this point, we embraced its warning and began to back away. The animal continued to glare at us until we were out of sight. I've always wondered if it might have been hiding its offspring up there, just beyond that ridge. If that were the case, can you imagine what might have happened to us had we decided to climb up there? The four of us made it back to our campsite without hearing another creepy scream, but we were much too shaken up to sleep. Elias was probably the only one who would have dared to stick it out. We were too anxious to deal with packing up the tent, so we decided to let them be until the next day. When we made it back to our cars, one of the guys turned on some music, and I remember how that helped ease my mind a bit. It seemed to calm me down just enough to come back to reality, and we quickly agreed that it had to have been a Sasquatch that we encountered. We stayed in and around our cars, sipping beers, and keeping our eyes out for the animal. While we waited for the sun to rise, I felt so much more secure as soon as it was light enough to see our surrounding, and the four of us made our way back to the campsite. Everything that we left behind appeared to be untouched. I'm not sure why, but I had expected to find the tent ripped to shreds. I guess I've probably seen too many horror movies. We didn't see or hear anything strange while we packed up our things. The environment went back to feeling normal, making it even more difficult to fathom the strangeness of what occurred only hours earlier. Elias was very open with others about the whole experience. He even introduced us to another student who claimed she had seen a family of Sasquatches while walking her dog in her hometown of Northern California. There was something about talking to that girl which, for me, had a way of confirming our experience as reality. It's not like I was wondering whether the four of us had somehow imagined it. It's just that it verified the Sasquatch as a species rather than a single legendary figure. I wish science would put more credible resources toward uncovering the truth behind this very tangible phenomenon. On to the next one. In Trinity Alps, I heard what I thought was music, one low voice or sound on one side, then another on the opposite side of the creek. I was cooking dinner with my small, optimist stove and had camp set. The sound was so strange that I picked up camp and hiked down the moonlit trail. All the time, I felt I was hearing limbs and sticks breaking above me on the ridge line. I was in the middle of my through hike of the Pacific Crest Trail, and had been out hiking since April 2nd. I have never heard these sounds in all my hiking or hunting days, past or present. In the morning, I stopped at a side creek to fill my water bottle. I walked above the trail for a deeper pool to dip the bottle in and found where something had crossed and slid over vegetation, going down then up. Next to the creek was a large footprint, 
in a small sand bar. The other prints were not as clear, but I wish I would have taken their pics as well. I haven't told many folks about the sound or prints till the last few years. I feel that Bigfoot is alive and well. I believe that there were two communicating across the creek. On to the next one. This was in summer, and, and I lived in Arcata, California, working as a volunteer botanist for Six Rivers National Forest. I was helping out a graduate student at Humboldt State University with his master's project. We studied wildlife and plants associated with freshwater ponds in the forest near Willow Creek. One weekend, my girlfriend and I drove up the Salmon River to go camping. It's a remote area. It seemed that most people up that way were either miners along the river or fire crews. Near Fork of Salmon, which is a town, we stopped and camped at a pullout near the mouth of the Little North Fork. The next day, we hiked up the stream, went swimming, and even saw a black bear on the trail, and later drove home. The following morning on Monday, my co-workers came to pick me up for the week's work, but I realized while packing that I was missing the telephoto lens to my camera. I remembered using it on the Little North Fork, photographing a frog, figuring I had laid it by a stream and forgotten it, I did not join my two co-workers. Instead, I called my girlfriend, told her what had happened, and asked if she would like to return to Little North Fork. Instead of roaring up there and back about a hundred miles, we decided to make a backpack trip out of it. We got up there, hiked the trail, found the lens, but decided to drive further up the paved road to a spot somewhere near Sawyer's Bar, where a dirt road followed the North Fork and led up to a trailhead where hikers could further follow up the North Fork and into the Marble Mountain Wilderness area. It was dark, so we donned packs and got up on the trail as far as we could before it got completely dark. There were no obvious campsites, so we rolled out our bags and literally slept in the middle of the trail. It's old growth forest. And we felt pretty alone. The next morning, we got hiking again, following the North Fork up a long forested valley. We passed one other camper that day who had stopped to swim and set up camp. We hiked on another four miles, and the trail left the river. It snaked up along the side of the canyon and became more of a narrow path. Always the dirt beneath our feet was covered with prints of bears. There were no human shoe prints, just bear prints. It was getting late again, and the topography map indicated a stream would cross the trail some distance ahead. So we pressed on, figuring to set up camp there. We soon heard water. At the crossing, we were very tired and were ready to drop our pack. But we both had a very uneasy feeling about the spot and agreed we couldn't spend the night there. Consulting the map again, we found that the trail branched up a little ways ahead and an unmaintained primitive path headed up the mountain to a small subalpine lake that we had earlier planned as our destination. The map showed the creek to cross the primitive trail shortly after the path left the main trail. We figured the trail junction might be a good place to camp since it would be closer to the creek hopefully without the feeling we were experiencing here. Soon we got there and found a small open area between the trees just off the trail, level and large enough for our sleeping bags and a fire. We dropped our stuff and then went down the start of the primitive trail to the creek, about 20 to 30 yards. It was in a steep, boulder choke, densely forested draw, full of log jams left from spring or winter torrents. It was barely a creek now in midsummer. It was getting dark again, and we had a bad feeling about being down in the creek bed. We hurriedly filled our cooking pots with water and got back up to our pack. We were tired after cooking. I remember arranging our pots and pans along a log on one side of us and the fire on the other side. I hoped if a bear entered camp during the night, he might knock the pots off the log and thereby wake us up. Sometime in the middle of the night, I had no watch, but the fire was completely burned down to ashes and coal. I awoke to a terrible racket 
going on down in the stream bed through the trees below us. It was the sound of logs and large rocks being hurled and crashing into things. I sat up in the dark and listened. I shook my girlfriend and told her to wake up. She, at first, buried her head in her bag and didn't want to hear the sound. I was really scared. It was totally dark. I knew there was no one around for miles, and I also knew that bears do not go rampaging around throwing things. I also knew darn well that anything living out there could possibly smell the remains of our fire. Whatever it was, it was clearly spending a lot of energy, either trying to scare us or angrily searching for something in one of the log jams. After listening for maybe 10 to 20 minutes, it's really hard to know how long my worst fears were realized. The crashing sound stopped, and soon there was the sound of footsteps coming up the slope directly toward us. It was on two feet, and they were clearly audible, heavy footsteps. By this time, my girlfriend was wide awake and sitting up in her bag, like me, listening. Although neither of us said it, we were both thinking of what it had to be. With the footsteps came the sound of labored breathing. Whatever it had been up to in the stream bed clearly had been hard work. I had a sheath knife, but standing to fight seemed out of the question. It was dark. This thing was big, and I was petrified. Just as it came up behind the trees immediately surrounding us, I flicked on my little flashlight, hoping to keep it at bay with the light. The light did not penetrate the darkness beyond the nearest trunk. The creature stopped just beyond the nearest tree trunk, about 15 feet away, and just stood there, breathing. The sound of the breathing was at least seven feet up in the air. I yelled, hey, with as loud a voice as my adrenaline could muster. The breathing paused momentarily, and the creature made a huh sound in response to not me directly, but more to itself. It was very careful to not reveal itself and used the tree line to avoid my light striking him. After this, it turned and walked through the brush and trees directly away from us, not back toward the creek, but parallel with the creek, heading downstream. The stride was unhurried. We quickly built the fire back up and stayed awake until dawn. After the sun came up, we got some sleep. After breaking camp, we dropped down to the creek before heading back up the path on the other side. I looked around briefly to see if I could see what the creature had been doing, footsteps, etc. But I found nothing. I wish now that I had gone down or upstream a bit, since the sound may not have originated at the crossing like I assumed at the time. We got up to the Lake of the Isle, kind of a shallow cirque lake as I recall, in the afternoon. There were some old campsites there, but no recent evidence of people. The place was scoured of firewood, though. I spent a lot of time hauling wood up the hill so we would have enough to last all night. I also stockpiled throwing-sized rocks. That night, we couldn't sleep. We would hear rustling in the brush near camp. I would throw rocks in the direction of the sound, probably raccoons or black bears, and build up the fire some more. We did that all night until dawn. We finally got some sleep. When we awoke, we both decided to bag it and hike out. We packed our pack and hiked all day. The last mile or so to the car, we hiked in late dusk. The thought of spending another night out there was out of the question. We were so paranoid by this time, we jogged the last half mile. That's it for the incident. Although we did not actually see the creature, neither of us have any doubt as to what it was. Up until that point in my life, Bigfoot stories were like the Loch Ness Monster, something intriguing that you sort of wanted to believe in but could never be sure about. For me, the matter of Bigfoot's existence was resolved that night 25 years ago. On to the next one. I've been investigating the Bigfoot species for nearly 20 years, mainly in Louisiana, but also in the surrounding southern states. I was born with a fascination with cryptozoology, and although you might find it hard to believe, I eventually found a local newspaper outlet that allowed me to promote my investigation theory. I didn't expect to receive many inquiries, but to my surprise, they soon started rolling in. Therefore, I want to talk about not one, 
but two of what I deem to be my most interesting encounters. The first encounter I'd like to share happened in Louisiana, near a place known as Chicot State Park. After promoting my services in the area, I received a call from an older woman who claimed to be terrorized by apes every time she cooked. It got to the point where she was too afraid to prepare any home-cooked meals because she wondered whether it would be her last. She invited me to stay in this charming little guest house that stood right beside the swamp on her property. It was one of those places that would be perfect for staying at around Halloween time. It was a setting straight out of a horror story. Cool stuff. As I had expected, she was a widow and had no relatives in the state. I remember thinking how lonely it must have felt to be at her age and have no loved ones to turn to when things got scary. After surveying the area, while it was still light outside, I didn't find a whole lot of physical evidence, and I believe that was mostly because of the type of terrain she lived in. Everything was squishy, making it hard for the ground to hold any real consistency. Anyway, I remember it feeling good just being there and giving this kind older woman someone to talk to, even if it was just for a few days. Something that I found so entertaining about this woman was that she had an enormous volume of moonshine. She explained to me that her late husband was very passionate about the beverage, and he had purchased enough to last longer than his lifetime, literally. She told me how she didn't care for the stuff as much as he did, but the smell and taste helped her feel like he was still around, watching over her. I'm more of a beer guy myself, but I did end up drinking a surprising amount of the stuff while I was there, and even developing somewhat of an appreciation for the harsh taste. It was the very first evening during my stay that the woman was cooking up her specialty, seafood gumbo. I must say that the aroma was wonderful, and I imagined that if any smells were going to attract these creatures, it would be this. My intuition ended up being correct. I remember that it was while the woman was pouring me another shallow glass of moonshine that I looked over her shoulder and spotted the creature staring at me through the window. This incident happened during the end of summer, so there was still a considerable amount of light in the evening hours. That enabled me to see the half-human, half a half face that had beady, dark eyes that sat very far apart. I would have imagined myself to spring up from my seat I was much too stunned to do so. I had seen similar entities on several occasions before this sighting, but this was the first time that I had been able to observe their details from what had to be less than 15 feet. When I pointed in the direction of the figure, the woman casually turned to look toward the window above the sink. Though I could tell she was timid, I could also tell that she was so used to seeing these things by this point. Still, that didn't prevent her from wanting these things to stay away from her land, and looking at the ugly mug on the thing, I could see why. I couldn't discern the height of the creature from where it stood, because I could tell it was ducking its head to look through the small window. But there was no doubt that it was considerably taller than me. The old woman turned back around, looking at me in silence, hoping for direction as to what we were going to do. That was the first moment in my strange career that I wasn't as capable as I had liked to imagine. All I could think to do at that moment was to use my finger to gesture for her to be quiet and not to move a muscle. Soon, I gained the courage to rise from my chair. The creature's eyes went wide as it was clear it was wondering what I was about to do. I think there's no question that it was surprised to see me, as I'm sure it was only used to seeing the old woman. I'm not exactly sure why I got up at that moment, but I think it was because I wanted to get an even closer look at its facial features. It was as I got within 10 feet of the creature that it dashed off to the right, only to return to the window less than 10 seconds later. Then it left again, before returning yet again. I then peeked into another room and observed the creature as it ran past that room's window on two feet. I watched as this creature did lap after lap around the small structure that the older woman resided in. Though she said the creature committed lots of odd behavior, this was the first time she had seen it do anything like this. Each time it returned to the kitchen window, it would briefly pause while looking inside before doing another lap. 
I should also mention how the creature was silent while running around the house. The only thing I could hear was its feet stepping throughout the mucky, squishy terrain. It was while I was looking through one of the other windows that I couldn't help but notice that this creature was indeed male, as its genitalia was out in the open and dangling from its groin. Therefore, it's my theory that the creature was acting in this strange way because another male was present on the property for the first time in a long time. I'm going to go ahead and guess that the creature did somewhere between 15 and 20 laps around the house before it eventually ran off. I wasn't able to see which direction it ran off into, but there came a time where it ceased from returning to the kitchen window. There was no further sign of it that night. The next morning, I went outside to see if I could locate any track, hair samples, or fecal samples. Luckily, I did come across what I considered to be a decent track. I had my casting kit with me, and that track is one I still have in my possession to this day. This incident would mark the second time I had experimented by setting up floodlights, not just on the house, but also in several areas that led up to her house. I stayed there for a few more nights without any sign of the creature returning. Once the older woman regained a sense of comfort, I decided it was time for me to take off. I frequently checked in with the old woman via telephone after departing and was very pleased to hear that the creatures had stopped coming around. Though, I will say, the older woman passed away about a year later, and I have no way of knowing for certain the truth about what finished her off. The second encounter I'd like to talk about happened in Dade City, Florida, which is relatively close to where I reside about six months while traveling with my trailer. Now, it's important not to confuse Dade City, Florida with Dade County, Florida. Dade County hosts the city of Miami, and is much further south than Dade City. I received a phone call from these two brothers who earned their living from purchasing old, rundown homes and fixing them up into desirable commodities. They explained to me how they had been having trouble working on their last project because these overgrown chimps were constantly throwing things at them while they were trying to work. Neither of them had been injured yet, but they were worried that it was only a matter of time. Of course, they were also worried that they were going to lose a hefty chunk of change if they weren't able to make their investment look attractive to potential buyers. Soon after speaking to them over the phone, I agreed to meet one of the brothers at the property one afternoon. While inspecting the area, I did come across numerous tracks that were much too large to belong to any human, even someone as tall as Yao Ming. They even directed me to a couple of large piles of excrement that couldn't have belonged to any local mammal, on account of their carnivorous content. It quickly became evident that these men were not joking around. I was permitted to camp out in my trailer on the property for what I think was a span of about two and a half weeks. They would have allowed me to stay in the house, but nothing was working on the inside. It was in that bad shape. I set up a few surveillance cameras in several areas to help cover most angles that surrounded the fixer-upper. I also set up three cameras in a triangle formation around my camper, as I was confident that whatever it was that was visiting the property would be interested in me and my trailer. For the first few nights, there was nothing. I was beginning to wonder if there was something about my presence that kept these creatures at bay. Maybe there was something about the trailer or the cameras that deterred them from coming too close. I thought, however, it was on the fourth night, I believe, that I was watching the surveillance camera from inside my trailer and saw a few dark figures dash past the area. It was close to midnight, and I was getting ready to hit the hay, but seeing that activity was more than enough to wake me up. I was amazed at how large they looked on camera, but how silent they were for the nearby microphone. At the risk of sounding funny, they reminded me of stealth ninjas that you see in the movies, the ones that seem to glide above rooftops while sneaking around. One of the first things I immediately noticed about these creatures was they all walked with a hunch. It was almost like their heads were protruding from their chest rather than from atop their shoulders. Keep in mind, this was at a time where they looked like shadows given how dark it was. It wouldn't be until later that I saw them with much greater detail. The next morning, 
I showed the brothers my video footage. One of them had to turn away from the screen due to how much these things had intimidated him. It was clear that it freaked him out just standing on the property in full daylight. I spent days walking about the property while also pretending to work on the house. I thought that if I attempted to mimic the activity of the brothers, it might help to lure the Sasquatch creatures into the camera frame, but I had no luck. There were a few strange noises while I was pretending to work inside the house, but as far as I could tell, nothing approached. Eventually, I started to grow a bit restless, and I placed raw stakes in various places throughout the property, some of which I placed atop the roof of the home. That was what did it, if anything. I was expecting only to see them take the meat at nighttime, but it was around late afternoon that I saw the clan up close and personal. Even though I knew these things were very real, it was staggering to see them get this close, almost like it was nothing to them. I thought they would have at least ran off with the steak, but no. I watched one of them bite large chunks from the raw meat as it stood on the roof and glared back at me. I fed them T-bone steaks, and as soon as the one on the roof finished nibbling on it and licking the bone like a popsicle, it threw the bone at my camper and started making this really weird hissing noise. A noise that I had never heard before. I can't really even think of what to compare it to, and I'm not even sure hiss would be the most appropriate word. After that, I watched it hop back down onto the other side of the house and quickly run to grab the bone. Keep in mind that I knew I was recording all of this on camera, so I was doing my best to remain calm and not do anything that might cause the creatures to run away. It was while I was entranced by watching this large animal return to sucking the content from the bone that I heard the noise emanating from within my trailer. When I turned toward the trailer, I noticed that the door was wide open and there were all sorts of sounds of objects getting tossed around. It was plain to see that one of the creatures was looking for more food. I then started to realize that I had likely made a bad choice by feeding these things. As if things weren't already overwhelmingly stressful for the two brothers, now they were going to likely be dealing with creatures who expected them to feed them. And sometimes when you train large predators to expect such things, they can become rather unhappy when those expectations aren't met. I should probably mention that these men were paying me to come up with a solution to their problem and to understand better what they were dealing with. So it wasn't exactly in my best interest to make these things want to come around more often. I don't know why I thought this was a good idea at the time, but I was desperate to get that thing out of my living space. I couldn't have it tearing the place to pieces, as it was the only home I had back then. I picked up a piece of nearby scrap wood and calmly walked to the side of my trailer and began to slap the outer wall, creating a lot of racket. As I said, that ended up being a restless act as the creature that was inside my trailer came storming out and charged me. I suppose it ended up working to my advantage that I stumbled backward and fell on my ass because it caused the creature to halt. It then became clear to me that it was a bluff charge, and I can even remember the way it seemed to smirk at me just before it turned around and headed back inside the trailer. There was something so noticeably human about that face, all while being so animalistic at the same time. I don't know if many people know this, but from my experience, the creatures that you come across in the South typically have few sharp teeth, whereas the ones that reside up North tend to have teeth that are more like ours. I can't lie. I was extremely frightened when the creature charged me, presenting its teeth, and it caused me to lose control of my bladder. So, when the creature smirked, I got the impression it was mocking me over getting dominated. It was as I was lying there on the ground that the one who was still sucking on the T-bone dropped what was left of it and ran inside the trailer. It was like it noticed its friend had found something of better value. I could hear them scuffling around inside the trailer for a bit. All the while, I watched as a third creature appeared from the other side of the house. Just like myself, it appeared to be wondering what was causing conflict inside my mobile home. This one didn't look to be very interested in being aggressive with me. Although I couldn't compare it to the other ones at the time, I did get the impression it was a little smaller, leading me to believe that it might be lower in command. Eventually, 
After a minute or so of scuffling, one of the creatures emerged from inside the trailer, holding a can of sour cream and onion-flavored Pringles that I had dashed inside one of the cabinets. There was a lot more food inside those cabinets, so I was already imagining the huge mess that I was going to have to clean up if I were to survive this encounter. Later, the other one popped out of the trailer carrying a large bag of black licorice. Although I'm a huge fan of that candy, I never in a million years would have guessed these things to be very interested. Those cabinets possess a variety of meat jerky, so I would have expected those things to be priority. However, perhaps they were more interested in things that they had never tasted before. To my surprise, it was then that I watched the smaller of the three creatures charge at the one holding the can of Pringles. Perhaps something about the strong odor prompted its curiosity and led it to a dangerous confrontation. As I'm sure you can imagine, the creature that was munching on the can of Pringles didn't take too kindly to the aggression. That was when the creature started to become much more chimp-like. Astonished, I watched as the two creatures tumbled all over the ground, hooting and hollering and viciously snatching and biting at one another. The other one just stood there enjoying what was left of the licorice, not at all minding the scuffle that was happening about 10 yards away from it. That was when I took the opportunity to rush inside my trailer and close and lock the door. As I stepped over the mess on the floor, I made my way over to my seat in front of the video monitor. As I should have expected, the monitors were all broken at the hands of the creature. I felt very helpless. All I could do was stand near one of the windows and watch this astonishing event play out. I then noticed an extremely foul odor as one of the creatures had taken a dump on the floor right near the bathroom area. It reminded me of when a child just barely misses the toilet. I continued to stand there, spectating the creatures from the window, when I heard something heavy land on top of the trailer. This is the part that gets really weird. It was as soon as I heard the loud thud on top of the trailer that all three of the Sasquatches froze what they were doing. It was as they turned their attention toward the roof of my trailer that they immediately scattered out of sight. It was very easy to tell that they were frightened by what they saw. Of course, seeing something of that size become scared made me feel a whole new level of fear. Even though I was scared, it was at that moment I would have done anything for the monitors to have been working. After all, there was not one, but three cameras directed toward the trailer. Everything seemed silent, aside from the faint but deep breaths that were barely audible from above. I think it was a few minutes that passed by before I heard what sounded like feet pressing off the roof. I then listened very carefully as I was expecting to hear some footsteps somewhere on the ground outside the trailer. But there was nothing. There was only pure silence. I know it probably sounds crazy, but it's always been a theory of mine that whatever was up on that roof had a set of wings. And that's as far as I'll go with it. When I've told that recount to the few people that are close to me, some of them express their theory that it could have been a guardian angel. That's interesting to think about, but I'm not the most religious person. So I try not to get too wrapped up in that kind of idea. Whatever it was, there's a dang good chance it was responsible for saving my life. As some of you might have guessed, that incident ended up being the one that motivated me to retire from that out-of-the-ordinary career. Don't get me wrong, I still love cryptozoology, but it's very rare for me to do any fieldwork following that last experience. Still, I probably read more literature on the subject than most others. It's something I'll forever remain passionate about. On to the next one. A foul-smelling creature that witnesses said may have been Bigfoot apparently slipped away from the Staunton Reservoir without a trace. Cheryl Campman and Eric Chalette reported hearing what may have been a large creature running up a hill on the south side of the lake at about 1.30 a.m. Monday. We were sitting out near the beach when we heard the shuffle of leaves and three loud thumps, Chalette said. It sounded like the creature was pulling up trees, causing a lot of damage, the two said. Chalette said there was a terrible rotten fish smell mixed with the odor of algae when the pond turns over. It's hard to describe, but it's pretty potent. 
Later Monday morning, as deputies with flashlights combed the area, Campman said she heard a growl and a roar from across the lake. At first, I thought someone was fooling with the public address system, but the sound wasn't near the cars and the car doors were not open. Shalette added, it sounded like a cross between a lion and a grizzly and lasted three or four seconds. Shalette and his girlfriend, both 21, come to the lake often, usually during the daytime, to catch bath. They said they have never encountered anything like Monday morning's episode. Neither have police and sheriff deputies who found no evidence of a foul odor or even one footprint. Authorities said, we didn't really see anything because it was so dark and cloudy, but we heard it on the side of the hill. We first thought someone was goofing off, Shalette said. Police advised us to clear out, and we did, he said. But the two can't help believing there may be something to the Bigfoot legend. It could be, Shalette said, looking across the water to the curve of inlets surrounded by trees. Well, if you find him, let me know, Stoughton Police Chief Larry Garback said, but calm him down first. On to the next one. My sighting happened years ago but I need to tell someone about it. I finally come to grips with it, and now it's time to just tell someone who won't think I'm not. Here goes. At one time, I lived in a house surrounding a small pond in the woods in Columbia. I fished all the time. The pond was down a small hill right in my backyard. I thought I was in heaven. I usually fished at night when my kids at the time were asleep. I used lighted bobbers. I often felt like I was not alone, but thought it was just my imagination. One evening, I thought I heard a huff growl and glanced around behind me. There it was, just standing there, looking at me. I squinted my eyes and rubbed them in case my eyes weren't seen correctly. I still saw it. I didn't feel panicked till it moved. The thought that it wasn't a human scared me so much. I dropped my pole and hightailed it all the way up the hill till I was safe in the house. I never went fishing at night or alone again. Thank you for listening to this. I feel better getting it out. I found it weird the huge owl that was usually sitting on a nearby gate wasn't there after that night. At that specific time, I was alone. But my two daughters and I heard knocks all the time. I thought it was teenagers. It was approximately 8 p.m. in November. My birthday present was a fishing rod. It was the following evening, the 16th. It is a wooded area with four houses around a pond. Coyotes howled every night. Owls were always hooting, and I loved it. On to the next one. In Lake County in Illinois, Matthew Eaton was walking back from a creek located between a neighbor's house when he saw what appeared to be a four-foot bipedal creature standing about 20 feet into the woods that were adjacent to a local creek. Its eyes appeared to be glowing red. Eaton stared at it and it stared back for what seemed to be a minute or so. Its body appeared to be entirely covered with fur of an unknown color. Its right arm was wrapped around one of the trees, which hit its right shoulder down while its other arm was resting along the creature's side. It had four to five long bony fingers. The head appeared to be an oval shape, and the face appeared to be hairless. After a few moments, it walked into the woods and vanished. On to the next one. Near Carlinville in Macoupin County in Illinois. My girlfriend and I spent the night at my house. Around 11.30 p.m., we were bored, and so my girlfriend and my two sisters and I decided to sneak out of the house and take a walk around the lake. There were other houses around this lake also. The skies were clear, and the weather was nice. We got about halfway around the lake when I heard something behind me and turned around to see. I was startled to see a big, tall, hairy thing about 13 feet tall, I saw it walk across the road about five feet behind us. I screamed, and my sister, who was 13 years old at the time, turned and saw it also. 
My baby sister was too little and can't remember. I don't remember if my girlfriend saw it. We took off running and screaming back to our house. We went into my bedroom and were awake the rest of the night, afraid to make a move, thinking it was still out there. I was 15 years old at the time. It was a clear night night. There were several houses in a wooded area on that lake. On to the next one. This was during the November deer season. I was hunting some ground north of Hedick, Illinois. About sunrise, I heard twigs snapping behind me to my right. I was in a tree stand overlooking a field, anticipating a deer, but no deer came out. But something yelled very loud that sent chills through me. What seemed like minutes, but was probably more like 30 seconds. What came out of the timber was walking upright and dark brown all over and somewhere between six and a half to seven feet tall. It was at the edge of one of the timber crossing to another, probably a distance of about 20 yards between the two timbers. This thing, whatever it was, did not seem concerned that I was there. I have been raised in Illinois all my life, hunting and out in the woods a lot, and I have never seen or heard anything like this, nor do I care to ever again. It was about sunrise in timber and cornfield. On to the next one. In Winnebago County in Illinois, on Cave Drive near Interstate 39, it was an autumn night. The weather was warm but very foggy. The area was at my house, which was in a glen near the Kishawaki River. Very dense forest area within a couple of hundred yards. The figure did not look like a big hairy ape. It was very tall, slender, and had very large eyes. The color appeared similar to the local deer. It was hiding behind a tree watching me. I have extremely good hearing and night vision. It made noise as I was getting into a car. With the door of the car open, I reached in and turned on the headlamp. It was peeking around a tree. It froze in the light but recovered quickly. We made eye contact which it held for several long seconds. It then turned and ran. Within three or four strides, it was able to hurdle a five to six foot tall fence without breaking stride. I was able to watch it run for several hundred feet, although my vision was hampered by the fog. At that time, I worked from home in my garage often at night and had heard many odd things before and after. I believe this creature to still exist and I plan on looking for it this summer. It was approximately between 10 and 10.30 p.m. On to the next one. In Sagamon County in Illinois, about 10 years ago, I saw something very peculiar. It was lying in the middle of the road, and I didn't notice it until I was about to hit it. As my ex-girlfriend and I swerved to the left lane to go around it, it got up and watched us drive around it. This thing was huge. I'm not exaggerating. It had to be close to 10 feet tall with white to grayish colored fur. I watched it, watch us drive away, and in my rear view for about a minute. Then it ran away on its legs just like a human. At that time, and for a few years after, I was in a sort of denial, telling myself it had to be some kind of polar bear that had gotten loose from a local zoo or something. After never hearing any news story about a missing polar bear, I put it in the back of my mind, always suspecting that it may have been a Bigfoot. As for my ex-girlfriend, the other witness, I haven't spoke to her in years, but I know that she saw it too, and was just as dumbfounded as I am. My ex-girlfriend had her head resting on my shoulder, attempting to nap. We were driving back to her house in Dawson, when I saw that, I nudged her and told her, look at that. It was late afternoon into evening. The light conditions were bright, if I remember it correctly. Bear in mind, this was 10 or so years ago. There was light snow on the ground with a bit of flurries. On to the next one. In St. Clair County in Illinois, my sister recalled a day sighting roughly 5 p.m. across our home in the strip mine. She was riding a small motorcycle down a rock road when she came over the hill to look at the mine lake. 
What she thought was a man was squatting, sifting water with his hands. When it heard the motorcycle, it turned and took off very quickly and uncharacteristically fast towards her. She turned and left as quickly as she could. She didn't notice the body, but the face had a large amount of white hair with a rough expression. The movement was very quick and bounding. When she glanced back, it was gone. My dad went over to see if he saw any sign of someone staying there, and there was nothing. Come to find out, there are many sightings in our area of something called the Silver Creek Freak. Nothing was found after the incident. There have been numerous sightings of what people called the Silver Creek Freak. It was spotted near the Dead End Road on the other side of the mines along Silver Creek, which runs off Jack's Run Road. It was 5 p.m. normal weather. It is an area of old strip mines with no houses around it at that time, but rural acreage that was wooded with a large lake. There was very little people traffic. On to the next one. In Sangamon County in Illinois, basically, it was the area of the Sangamon River bottoms between Old Route 36 Bridge and the Route 54 Bridge in Riverton. It must have been at least 15 years ago. I was riding my mini bike through the trails in the area. I lost control of the bike in a sand pit among some deep shrubbery. As I looked up to get my bearings, I saw a large hominid creature standing next to a tree about 25 yards ahead of me. I was slightly disoriented from the crash, but what I saw was a large male-looking individual more than seven feet tall, very heavy built with thin reddish hair covering its body. It looked at me for just a moment and it walked into the thick brush. That was basically it. I remember it very clearly. It was around 10 a.m. in the wooded river bottom. On to the next one. As part of an upward move within the company in which I was employed, a major shipping firm whose offices are located in Kentucky, I relocated to my current home. Through a local Masonic Lodge, I became acquainted with a group of men who were starting to form a cattle consortium designed to raise Black Angus cattle for the retail food market. I had expressed some interest in learning about what their plans were, as well as what might be involved in becoming a partner. After a number of meetings and discussion, each of the four starting members would be required to put up $250,000 for a total of $1 million of startup capital. Now, there is so much involved here that I could talk about. Suffice to say, we were partnering with some farmers to make use of their pastures and field in the form of a lease so that we could raise our cattle on them. It was quite an enterprise to get started. But once all of the dots were connected, we started on the road to profitability rather quick. All of these guys, myself included, had a fair amount of business savvy. Even if we hadn't achieved success, we could have sold off our stock with no problem whatsoever since the market for Black Angus was exceptional in nature. I had cashed out much of my corporate stock to fund my end of the venture, and at that time in my life, I was about six years away from my projected retirement and thought this would be a great future investment. It turns out it was. This story actually began seven years later when I was a year into retirement and one of the ranchers whose farm we were leasing had begun to show a few losses of our cattle. It started as some calves coming up missing with some of them being found in the woods, badly mauled and partially eaten. As time went on, other large cattle were being found in the pasture with enormous wounds and flesh torn out of their hide. We had all gone out to personally survey the damage that was being done to the livestock. It was the general suspicion that a bear or cougar was the culprit, which would probably have to be shot to stop the mayhem. The farmer decided to hire a local hunter to both stake out and protect the herd. The herd on this farm alone represented over one million dollars. And when you lose one of these animals to a predator, it represents a big hit to the pocket, both now and into the future. Now, it's not like these incidents had occurred within a week's time. They had been observed over a period of many months. Two of these attackers had resulted in a mutilation and death. 
and the others in injury to a still living animal. Our hired hand was patrolling the pastures on horseback, making it virtually impossible for him to be everywhere at once. And even after hiring this gentleman, one mature female and another calf had still been taken under his watch. Both were found in the woods, partially eaten. One of the oddities was that none of the fences had been taken down or damaged in any way, which would indicate that something had breached it. Whatever was doing this had come over the fence and went back over the fence, carrying hundreds of pounds with it, all while doing no apparent damage to the fence in the process. To date, all that the hand had seen was some bobcat and a couple of coyotes, none of which were capable of inflicting the carnage on the herd. One night in fall, the hand had planned to ride the pasture up until about midnight. Upon our request, he was mixing up his ship a bit in hopes of catching whatever was killing the cattle. On this day, he was riding through one pasture, heading over to check on another herd. Suddenly, he heard an uproar from behind the herd he had left some ten minutes earlier. He turned his horse around and galloped back, and was shocked to see the herd huddled in one end of the pasture as he came over the hill. He immediately began to survey the pasture, and his eyes became fixed on a large mass in the middle that was not moving. As he approached the mass, he realized that he was looking at the bull lying on the grass. He began to circle it, but his horse started to buck, unwilling to continue in the area. He dismounted to discover the grim reason behind why the bull had been lying there. Its head had been torn from its body and was nowhere to be seen. He went back to the house to tell the owner of his discovery, after which they took the pickup truck and a floodlight and headed back out to the pasture together. When they got up to the scene, they saw something incredible. The bull's head had been torn from the shoulders, including its spinal column. It had been ripped off, not severed. This was a strong, viable bull and the most important animal in the pasture. It was through his prowess that the herd continued to grow, and they could not begin to even guess what had been capable of such a thing. He was worth his weight in gold, and now he was dead. A decision had to be made about how we were going to deal with this dilemma moving forward. To date, the losses were mounting into the tens of thousands of dollars with no end in sight. Either whatever was doing this was going to be killed, or we would abandon this pasture land and move our herd elsewhere. So we devised a plan to stake out the acreage with as many armed men as was thought might needed to kill the beast that was attacking the herd. In the end, we hired 13 men. Each was to be stationed in a different area, and all would be in contact via radio. We were now fully committed to killing this monstrosity. Of the 13 men, seven had night vision sights on their guns. The pastors were stocked out for three weeks, but nothing happened. It was on the 23rd night of the 24-hour stakeout that one of the men over the radio reported something running across the pasture on all fours, which looked like a massive bear. Moments later, he was saying, Oh my God, it's standing on two legs and walking towards the herd. It's gigantic. Seconds later, the sound of two rifle shots broke the silence of the night. As he started shouting, I got it, I got it. Everyone started to converge on that end of the pasture when the hunter suddenly started shouting onto the radio that the beast was running toward the fence. The search continued throughout the night for whatever he had shot, but nothing had been found. He said he had been able to see it clearly in the night vision scope. It was some type of massive furry beast that walked like a man after running through most of the pasture like a bear. He said when it was on its feet, nearing the herd, he could see that it was at least twice the height of the cattle's back. After the men had given the search their all, they called the police with nothing being found until two days later. On the local news, it was reported that a motorist had seen what she described as a dead Bigfoot on the side of a highway. On the local news, it was reported that a motorist had seen what she described as a dead Bigfoot on the side of the highway. After hearing the report, we had made calls to the police department but they denied there being any Bigfoot found. They said she had seen a dead black bear and nothing more. As it turns out, after our man had put two rounds into that giant hairy beast that night, 
And after the woman said she saw a dead Bigfoot on the roadside, our problem ended rather abruptly. Not a single head of cattle was ever injured or found dead in that pasture land again. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!